I think a lot of us are aware that following on from Grenfell, the Grenfell Tower fire, that actually at the heart of what happened at Grenfell has been attitudes to council and social housing. And therefore actually addressing the question of gentrification, addressing the question of social cleansing, which actually actually North Kensington, in particular the area around Grenfell, had been fighting against before the 14th of June, that this is significant not just for North Kensington, but we know it's significant for the whole of London. These are campaigns that we've been fighting. So our first speaker today is Sean Berry, and Sean is a, um, Green mem a mem member of the Green Party and sits on um, the London Assembly, sorry, I was going to say the GLA, the London Assembly. She's also chair of the Housing Committee on the London Assembly and a councillor of Camden. So welcome, Sean. Well, um, thank you so much for, for having me um, here today. Um, it is awful what's been happening in, in housing over the past decade, really, starting with uh, the Almos campaigns that we had in the, the 2000s. Uh, we bitterly fought off an Almo um, in Camden, uh, which is where you all are today. This is Camden. Um, but in lots of places, that happened under the new Labour government. We've had a lot of changes made um, with, with council housing not being built, with any new social housing being built by housing associations, housing associations taking over a lot of council housing, the decimation of council housing stocks through right to buy, through sell-offs, through demolitions. Um, it's, it's all been absolutely um, all in one direction of, of diminishing the amount of council housing we have. Um, but one thing was, was kind of ignored and or not really paid that much attention to um, until Grenfell, which is how much council housing residents, social housing residents are not listened to, who have their concerns and worries sidelined, who when they get organised are vilified as, as troublemakers, as, as people who need to be blocked or kept out of council meetings instead of letting them speak and have themselves listened to. And that really, really came to the fore at Grenfell almost immediately because all of us went to look at the blog of the Grenfell Action Group. And when you get to that blog, yes, yes, there's the horrible blog that says one day there's going to be a fire and it's and it's chilling to read that but then there's blog after blog after blog which is their long long fight to be listened to by Kensington and Chelsea Council by the TMO that was running their homes um, and the way they were treated was was absolutely abominable now they're they're now getting a public inquiry into this um, as a result of the fact that that this became uh, a question of life and death not just of health and safety um, and and they they say this they say you know we, we live in social housing but we come from all walks of life we played by the rules we did everything that was asked for us we raised concerns through all the proper channels and we were completely ignored by those with the power to help us. Um, that's something I'm trying to fight to change in the London Assembly. We held uh, a really useful open mic session in the Assembly uh, last in May um, when social housing residents from all around London, organised by the London Talent Federation, came and told us the different ways in which they were being ignored or sidelined. And in some cases, the ways in which they were able to exercise some power, um, largely because they were they were tenant managed. Um, TMOs, proper TMOs, ones that are not covering whole boroughs, do seem to be much better at this. Um, and that's that's something we've been putting to the, the housing associations. Um, but the other thing, Grenfell came right in the middle for me of a very big battle about regeneration and demolition. And that's mainly what I want to talk about. I've used half my time not talking about it, damn. Um, but I did want to talk about that because that that is a very big fight. We've been all been quite aware of the amount of, of demolition that's going on on council homes, the amount of regeneration schemes that are actually social cleansing schemes where you might have two or three hundred, two or three thousand sometimes council homes that are a community that people live in and they are just condemned by the government. You hear the words sink estates used and then master plans come forwards, planning applications go in, people fight them um, 
and and they were they were failing to stop these these schemes from going ahead. So we've seen the destruction of the Haygate Estate, the Aylesbury Estate is is undergoing demolition at the moment, and it's it's absolutely horrendous. Um, and I started working on this uh, as an assembly member when I got elected in 2016, and so it was it was really important when Grenfell happened um, that it was right in the middle. It really highlighted so many of the issues I'd been I'd been working on. So I wanted to run through some successes that we've had actually because working with um demolition watch working with um councils uh, sorry working with residents on council estates right across london we managed to to turn around the mayor of london's policy on regeneration and on ballots and it's it's a very major victory because i think for me um uh, my role and I, I you know i get involved in some of the individual battles but actually my role is to get the rules changed so that people have the power to have their own say over their homes in, in, in the future on scheme after scheme after scheme. If we can fix the rules then and give the residents a real final say, a real ballot over what happens to their estate. All the other things we complain about, the, the, the made up fake statistics, the, the um, condition surveys that say the estate's about to fall down and needs to be demolished, um, the, the the lies that get told in order to get planning permission through. If you've got a final say in a ballot, all of that can't really happen. It's the one thing that really really um, assures that residents are listened to, and it's just giving residents power. Um, and Sadiq Khan implied when he became mayor that he was going to do that. His policy was regeneration shouldn't go ahead uh, without residents having, you know, residents having, giving permission for it. And then when he produced his uh, estate guidance, so it was the best practice guidance for estate regeneration, it was absolutely useless. Um, it literally said, don't do ballots. I mean, it said ballots can be too binary. And so, you know, to me, there's nothing more binary than shall we knock this down or shall we not knock this down? There's no sort of halfway there, really. It's a binary choice, and you need to be putting that choice to residents. But his draft guidance was, was against it. Now, this came out in uh, December 2016, so not that long after he got elected, we, we pushed for it and, it and it came out and there was a big consultation. And um, people, people like Demolition Watch, residents from all over London, organized, held meetings, uh, put thousands of postcards in, in response to the consultation. Hundreds of groups wrote their own responses. I wrote my responses, the housing committee wrote their responses. Um, the assembly passed a motion saying that the mayor should have ballots as well. So we were kind of all pushing in the right direction. Um, and then after March 2016, when the consultation closed, nothing happened for months and months and months and months. And we were asking, what were the results of this consultation? When are you going to announce your, your final guidance? And we waited and we waited. And we waited until February 2018. So that's nearly a year. That's like 11 months nearly after the draft consultation closed. And then finally he came out with his policy. And his policy was to have ballots, to make them a funding condition, a condition of giving his funding to an estate regeneration scheme is that residents must have a ballot and this must be binding. So we were absolutely overjoyed. Residents all around London were going, yeah, we'll get a ballot now. That's fantastic. Um, but we did have some questions about the delay. And one of the first questions we put in the next day was, okay, so in the last year, how many... It's a funding condition. In the last year, how many funding contracts have you signed and on which estates? Um, and he wouldn't answer this. Um, normally, I put in a mayor's question and it gets answered about a week and a half later. Uh, and a month and a half later, I still hadn't got an answer on this. And then finally, a, a Freedom of Information request got answered because there's laws about that and he had to answer. Um, and we found out that in the year since that, that had gone by between the, the draft and the final guidance, 34 estates had had their funding signed off by the mayor and now wouldn't be getting a ballot according to his new conditions. 16 of those in the final two months. So I was absolutely furious about that. And so while we've got a new policy going forwards, that is going to ensure, and there are, there are, there are good 17 estates that are not in contract yet. Those estates will get ballots. That includes Central Hill in Lambeth. But there are three other estates in Lambeth who have had their funding signed off. Um, so it's a, a real betrayal to me. Those residents were very, very excited to get a ballot. And then they were told, not even immediately, after we forced the information out, that, that actually they wouldn't. So there's, there's battles to go on on those estates. But we've changed the rules, and I'm so happy about it. Um, the next thing I want to say is, is there's another rule we ought to be changing. Um, and that is to get Section 1 of the Equality Act 
um, put into, into law. And that is, um, you'll be familiar with the Equality Act, ensuring that you can't make policies that, that have a, a disproportionate effect on particular ethnic groups, particular ages, uh, people with disabilities. You've got to have due regard to equalities in, that, in those aspects under that Act. Section 1 is all about socio-economic impacts and assessing those and having due regard to the effects of, on your, of your policies on inequality. Um, but it's not enacted, I think the word is. It's not in force. Um, it's written, but it's not been made into law by the government yet. It has been made into law by the government in Scotland starting in April, following a, a campaign there. Um, and I think it's going to make a huge difference. We can't say yet what the impact has been on Scotland. But I think that would have a huge effect right throughout England and Wales, and not just in housing policy, but particularly in housing policy. If you think about the Haygate estate and the displacement of residents, the, the impact it had on people on lower incomes compared to people on higher incomes. That's fine. Um, if you think about the socio-economic effects of the regenerations that we've seen, those policies wouldn't survive being run past that duty. And I think that's, that's our next big fight. I think, we, you know, obviously we have to fight for the individual estates and I'll, I'll be down there and I'll be doing that. But I think we also have to be looking at changing this fundamental rule. Um, and I also work in transport. And if you think about that as well, there are, there are ways in which policies that favour people in cars over people who have to take buses. There are things like you know, bus cuts that have been highlighted this week. Um, those policies have different effects on people from different classes, people from different incomes and backgrounds. And those policies then become um, JRable, in the words of many campaigners, that you can judicially review policies like that for not having due regard to equality. And I think that would have such a big effect on so many of the campaigns that I work on, so many of the different issues that I try and deal with, that I think we all need to, to join the campaign now. So just to plug that, it's the campaign by an organisation called Just Fair. Um, at the meeting in the Assembly, we had um, people from Race on the Agenda come and speak to us and, and put this to us as an Assembly. Um, I'm really hoping that I can get the rest of the Assembly Housing Committee to agree to this being one of our recommendations as well. One of the things about working on the Assembly is I have to work with the other parties. Um, so the motion that we got through the Assembly to back ballots um, was something where I had to persuade the Conservatives um, and, in fact, UKIP we have on the Assembly as well, um, to back that policy. Which is which is hard, um, but but doable. It's, if something's common sense and about basic democracy, you can persuade people. And when you do, when you've got a unanimous vote from all those different parties, then it's very very hard for people to do anything else. It was very hard for Sadiq Khan not to have ballots. So I think if we all we all work together and we try and get everybody to agree that socio-economic disadvantage needs to be an equalities issue and actually in law as one, then then we can win. So I'm, that that is my next mission, and hopefully I can persuade the rest of the housing committee to, to join in. Um, but, but meanwhile, we're going to hear from um, Defend Council Housing, um, who are going to talk a bit more detail about some of the other issues, because there's so much that there is to do. There are so many um, people who need your solidarity who are defending their homes. Uh, there are planning applications going through all the time. Uh, the Mayor of London needs to keep hearing from us about funding decisions. And in places, in these 34 estates where they've been denied a ballot, we need to be fighting for them. There's going to be uh, a motion put by the new Green Group on um, Lambeth Council uh, in the next council meeting, which I think is on the 18th of July. Um, and the more people who can turn out to the Lambeth Council meeting to, to support them, the, the better, because that motion is to, to give the residents on those estates in Lambeth who were denied a vote by Sadiq a vote from the council. And I think it'd be very hard for, for Lambeth Council to disagree with that. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to, to more questions because I've got numbers and all kinds of other things that I can, I can tell you about. But for now, thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Eileen Short, who's a long-time housing uh, tenant activist, uh, member of Defend Council Housing and Homes for All. Eileen. Thanks. So, I'm going to assume that we, everyone in this room knows that we are witnessing a housing crisis the likes of which we haven't seen mostly in our lifetimes. Obviously, some people come from other places in the world where things are bad, but in our lifetimes, 
we have seen as a result of political decision making, we have seen a two thirds cut in the amount of council housing that we have, a doubling in homelessness, and it's going, it'll be more than that rapidly, and a driving of a whole generation of people into private renting, into private renting with really only two months. Any private rental is really two months away from eviction if the landlord chooses. And with rent levels, I mean, people talk about people paying a third of their income in rent, but honestly, every private renter I know is talking about paying 50% of their income and more to rent places that are the least fit of the least good standard of repair of any housing tenure, which is not to say that every private renter lives in a hovel and a flea pit. I mean, they exist, definitely. But damp and mould and unsafe electrics and a landlord who you cannot make come and do anything about it is, from what I can gather, the common experience not just of young people, but of people in their 30s and 40s trying to bring up children when you're moving every year at least and worrying about whether your kids can stay in the same primary school. This is a broken housing system and it's broken in our lifetime. This is, when people talk about neoliberalism, this is not an abstract concept. This is the rolling back of the gains we won through social warfare. And today we end up in the place where the rights of tenants, of private renters, the rights to rent control and the rights to demand of your local and national politicians that they fulfil the provision of housing so that most people have got a secure roof over their heads. That was, in 1980, one in three people in Britain lived in a council house. And that was a transformation not just for those people, but for everybody in need of housing because there was a secure base of housing provision which helped to keep down rent, helped to set a tone, helped to make sure that from Aberdeen to Southampton, you had genuinely mixed places where teachers and teaching assistants and nurses and bus drivers and the unemployed could all live in the same community because we could afford to. That has been ripped up in our lifetime. And, and so when Jeremy Corbyn says that Grenfell, which was a politically caused tragedy. It wasn't, it didn't happen just because there's a fire. There are fires all the time, but only if you deregulate, privatise and refuse to listen to the people who know about what's happening in a block and systematically uh, denigrate them and think it's acceptable to save £5,000 by putting petrol-filled flammable cladding on the outside of their homes, that's when you get a disaster like Grenfell. So when Jeremy Corbyn said Grenfell is the symbol of failed housing policies, this is a, this is a critique not just of what happened at Grenfell, but of the situation we face and the policies we have to break because in order to avoid another Grenfell, and let me say, sorry, is this mic, is that better than that? Yeah, or can you hear anyway? Yes, fine. There are at least another 311 high-rise blocks which are at fire risk. This, the government accepts this. They have been at fire risk, that was discovered in the, in the wake of the Grenfell fire. 
And you know how many of them have been had the cladding completely removed? Ten. Ten. So not only has this been a disaster, but the disaster continues. So that is the challenge. And what I want to argue very clearly is that this is not simply a question of a gentle process of rolling back an unfair system. If you think about what happened in the 30 years that brought us to here, if you think about the battles that council tenants have had to fight to hang on to the bits we've got, but if you think of the battles and the wars inflicted on us as working class people, if you think about the miners' strike and the other big battles that were part of allowing, that was created the situation in which they could inflict this damage on us. You think about that, and then you think about what the challenge is to break these policies, because break them we have to. And Jeremy Corbyn and Labour have made a good start in Corbyn said in his 10-point plan that he wanted, he was committed to building a million new homes over a period of five years, half of them council housing. On the first anniversary of the Grenfell fire, there was a protest and John MacDonald spoke at it and he repeated that commitment to build 500,000 council homes. But Labour's manifesto in the last election didn't repeat it. It fell into talking about lower numbers, but also about affordable housing. Now, anybody that's been following the discussions, I don't want to get us bogged down in it, but the, in 2010, the Tories introduced a new definition of a thing of a new invented affordable housing that actually was 80% of market rents. That's not affordable in most of the language that most of us speak. And there is, I think, in response to the real pressure on housing, which Every politician that you talk to knows about that. It's the main thing, it's the main problem that people come to their councillors and their MPs and so on to say, please do something about this terrible housing situation for me and my community. Um, and so, of course, a generation... Oh, I, across the piece, politicians are looking for ways to fix it. They're looking for ways to make it fairer, to nudge it in, in a better direction. I think we'd have to say that so far they're failing. So Sadiq Khan, who's the newly elected London mayor that Sean was talking about, has produced a new plan for housing in London and a new London affordable rent definition. I'm not going to do a full critique of it now, but there are people in this room who can and hopefully will. But it's 50 quid more than the average council rent, and that's for starters. And some of it is you pay a, what would be called an intermediate rent, a higher than a council rent, for 10 years, by which time you're expected to have saved up enough to get out of it and go and buy somewhere. This is not. This is segmenting the market and thinking, you lot over there look like you've got a penny in your pocket, so we'll develop a new housing brand that you can afford, and meanwhile you, the residue over here, will try and put you somewhere else. This is not. This is trying to play the market and use the market to segment housing even further in the hope that somehow this will solve the problem. 
and Labour have now produced a green paper, which is, if you like, setting out their stab at a new housing policy. It's called Housing for the Many. And it has some very good things in it. It talks about ending this mythical affordable rent tenure. It talks about scrapping the bedroom tax. It talks about pausing, though not scrapping, universal credit. It talks about stopping and suspending right to buy. A lot of good progress, mostly as a result of the pressures. It doesn't talk about building council housing. It doesn't give a firm commitment to doing something about housing associations which have been deregulated and behave increasingly like big corporate landlords. It doesn't commit to holding on to public land in order to build public housing on it. And worst of all, in a way, it talks about returning housing investment, so housing capital investment to build new homes in the public or non-market sector, they will restore that to the 2010 level. You cannot build homes at the 1970s level that we need it. You cannot build 100,000 council homes a year if you return the funding to the 2010 level. And I think this is the heart of the matter. I would say, and I should just pay credit to the role that Sean and the Greens on the London Assembly have played in highlighting and, if you like, um, galvanizing a link between the campaigns out on the street and the taking the pressure to the mayor. They've helped and played a very good practical role in, if you like, closing the deal on some of those issues. But again, there are people in the room who, you know, the Green Party's policies have not always been consistent and suffer from the sa some of the same problems that Labour do um, because there are some fundamental issues and one of them is the money and the power. How do we build a new generation? How do we guarantee a very basic thing, which is a safe, decent quality, energy efficient home as a right for everyone? This is not the stuff of revolution. This is the stuff of reform, but how do we make it happen? And I think what's clear is that we need to have policies that break with the current policies. So we need to implement Corbyn's pledge. We need a new generation of 100,000 council homes a year at least. We need to reform private renting, control private rents, and introduce renters' rights. We need standards for all landlords, and if those landlords don't meet them, those homes need to be taken over and run as council homes, as indeed happened, but with money changing hands in the 60s and 70s. We need to scrap the Housing and Planning Act. We need to rec respect and recognise the right of independent tenant organisation. But we need to work out the policies and the action, the where are the class forces that we can use to make that happen. Who are the people who are going to put enough fear, who are going to carry, if you like, the social power, the social force to push back the developers and the landlords to cut across the attempts to blame migrants and the people next door and gypsies and travellers and say, no, migrants didn't cause these, this problem. 
Migrants are part of the wider working class movement that we need to build to resist you, the landlords and de the developers. And that is not just resistance in words and in policies, but in action. So it will be rent strikes and occupations and taking this fight to where it needs to be. That's the movement we have to build. And that's it, what Defend Council Housing and Homes for All and some of the other tenant groups have been trying to do. There's information at the back. There's a contact list that will go around if you're up for being part of that. But we need to discuss how it doesn't matter if you don't agree with every dot and comma, because if you agree everybody needs a roof, then you are part of this movement. And along the way, we will discuss the differences maybe about how we implement, how far, how, what the best tactics are, what the best strategy is. But if you want to see it change, then we have to break with the old policies, not nudge them. I'll come to the front. Yeah, so as you notice, I have a prop up here. Um, basically, I want to talk about um, one of the really important things is um, obviously holding elected representatives in into account and, of course, taking direct action as well. And I'm part of an organization called ACORN, which is a tenants' union. And basically, we are a community-based union where we hold unscrupulous landlords to account and we support our members. We uh, and then we have the bigger political battles as well. We um, we're, we're leading campaigns about ending uh, um, unfair evictions and uh, Section 21 in particular, because the housing market, in my opinion, is the biggest example of the failure of neoliberal policies. And we need a broad working class solidarity movement to combat it. Um, we, the ACORN, already have established groups in Bristol, in Brighton, in Manchester, in Sheffield. And one example of an activity that we did which was really successful is Santander, which is a bank that, uh, on its mortgages, uh, had a clause where landlords were able, allowed to not rent to students, migrants, or benefit claimants. They were allowed to... Uh, you know, not take these people on. And obviously, like, 10 years since the financial crash, which the banks caused, and which started due to property speculators in the US, this is a bit out of order, right? So we organized a day of action outside the, uh, the, 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 store, the Santander in Bristol. And before we even took action, they emailed us to say, oh, we'll scrap it. We don't know when, but we'll scrap it. So it shows how even if such a small amount of us take action, what we can achieve. And I guess uh, my main particular question, I guess, uh, after that, is um, what w do you have any direct plans about what you do about Section 21 unfair evictions? And also, uh, you know, uh, please join ACORN. Um, <laughs> uh, we'd normally recommend an hour wage a month, but if, if, you're, if you're strapped for cash, don't fret. You can join for as little as one pound a month. And it's not like... Uh, it's not like a service where you pay your dues and you do it. We expect you to be involved in your community. We expect you to support other members and support other tenants and, you know, deal with the issues around housing. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you can have a debate about housing without actually not talking about homelessness. And, um, you know, we'd all agree, wouldn't we? It's an absolute disgrace, the number of people um, who have been forced onto the streets. And, and, and um, you know, that's happening right around the country. Now, I was a social worker in, in Wolverhampton um, until I survived it and retired. And I worked on the emergency team there. And every night, you'd have people phoning up saying, I've got nowhere to live. Um, you know, sometimes it was a family. You had to go through stupid questions to ascertain how vulnerable they were under the uh, terms of the Homelessness Act, which is obviously, as you know, part of the Housing Act. And, you know, you'd put them up for the night or the person up for the night, give them some money, take them some food, and you had an expectation when you sort of said, go to housing the next day, um, that, you know, something was going to be offered. Now, Wolverhampton's a Labour council, and 
what was actually happening was I'd come on shift the next night and the same person or the same family would be ringing me up. And so I went to housing and nothing actually happened, you know, because I didn't meet the criteria. But fundamentally what it was about was saving money and there was no provision, okay? So I think homelessness um, is a major, major issue and something needs to happen around that. Um, now, when I go to um, Wolverhampton Town Centre, I go to... Uh, SWP meetings on a Wednesday night, and like hundreds, no, that's an overstatement, and approaching 100 people, young people mainly, living on the street there, and all they've actually got to look forward to is a soup kitchen kind of organised that comes out to them in the evening. Now, I think change actually happens from below, and, you know, you've got the housing up, you've got the, you know, race relations up, and all of that stuff, because the working class actually fought to actually achieve those things and put the screws on the government of, of the day. And I think that's actually what needs to happen here as well around the questions of homelessness. Because I think when you're homeless, not only are you disempowered, you have nothing. You know, you're not, you're not entitled to mental health services. You're clearly not entitled in Wolverhampton um, to housing. Um, and, and, you know, you have no voice. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm up for actually, you know, when I go to my next meeting, stopping over on the way and actually talking with people there about, let's go down the council offices and actually put the screws on the Labour councillors there, some Tories, but whatever council it is, they actually need to be expo exposed for the shame of homelessness. And like everybody else, I think, you know, one of the positives of Grenfell okay, was the day when, you know, they actually got down to the civic centre there and, you know, probably like the rest of you, were saying, get in there and have their heads, really, because it was about profit. They didn't give a damn about the fire and that can still continues because the proof of it is that people are still not got proper accommodation and housing. So I think we need to look at homelessness as a major issue. Hello, uh, my name is Marta. I'm um, a member of SWP from uh, Lancaster. Um, I just wanted to brought attention uh, to um, survivors of uh, domestic abuse. Um, I'm a worker at, at one of uh, refugees uh, in uh, Lancashire. And the uh, situation with uh, refugees at the moment are really uh, not so great, uh, especially with the, the, the change in changes about how, how the, those, those um, supported accommodation, how they go going to be funded. Um, what, uh, as a, as on an everyday basis, we, we, we try to support uh, families, that are ma a majority of them, they women and children, um, with uh, legal uh, issues, with, with uh, benefits, with jobs, but the priority is safe housing for them. And uh, Till only a few weeks uh, ago, uh, in uh, district when I work, uh, council has uh, has no uh, obligation to rehouse families from different areas of England because they did the the families had to have like local connections. Uh, only just a few weeks uh, ago th that has has changed, which is a great um, uh, opportunity for fam for families who are looking for safe. Uh, houses in uh, areas uh, uh, different than, than the, the pre previous ones, um, and uh, it's uh, I would uh, really um, recommend you to also support women's aid uh, campaign to to save uh, refugees to to build more. Only in uh, my workplace, which only provides six bedrooms uh, for for uh, families, for the last two two years we uh, had to uh, reject three hundred uh, and fifty children because we didn't have space. Uh, that was the only uh, issue. So uh, I just thought that it, it was quite important to talk about it. And also, uh, as a worker, uh, I just uh, come, uh, the, the, uh, as a worker on refuge, uh, I can see um, on a daily basis how capitalism doesn't work, how system doesn't work. And it's really important for, for uh, all of us to, to, to uh, speak with our colleagues in the workplaces how we can make change and uh, please join SWP and join us to fight uh, against uh, that system. Thank you. Sorry. 
Um, I hardly know where to start because there are so many issues when you're a council tenant. Um, I mean, when, when I got my council place back in quite a while ago now, everyone was jealous of me, actually, because like, it was a really big, big thing. It was a good thing to get a council flat, you know? And, um, and now we're, we're just sort of scum and rubbish and, all the, you know, it, it was, we, there were mixed communities and it was brilliant, and now we're just treated like rubbish. Um, one, one of the big issues, I think, that never gets mentioned is there used to be consultation meetings. So there'd be a meeting like this and we could all come along. What they do now is they have consultations, maybe in a room like this, but what they'll do is they'll, they'll be little um, pictures and, and, and things and you go around to each one. So you're doing it on a one-to-one -one basis and there's some suited and booted guy telling you how wonderful the new development's going to be when what you know is you're going to be eating brick dust for the next three years. And then there's going to be a load of places built that, you know, are, are just going to mess up your view of the river or whatever. But so th the whole consultation thing is really important. I think that this sa saying it should be made absolutely important that, that consultation meetings have to be meetings rather than walking around to little bits. Because on a one-to-one -one basis, I mean, for example, just uh, we had one just after the Lacknell fire. We were just having UPVC windows fitted. And I said, look, um, it just been on the front page of the standard that that may have been one of the problems with that helped the fire spread. I said, look, shouldn't we hold off until the end of the um, of the inquiry? And the guy said to me, are you a leaseholder or a tenant? And I said, a tenant. He said, well, you get what you're given then, won't you? Um, now, now it, he couldn't have done that in a big meeting. He could do it because it was on a one-to-one -one basis. And I think that's really important. We've had non-stop work. I'm Lambeth council tenant in our area for the last uh, 10 years or so. They've been building loads and loads of places. They've built 6,000 new places along the river, blocking our lovely views. Um, most of those are empty. And that's another thing, is like, th there are homes. There are homes have been built. And, and l l London, uh, you know, the, the London mayor, and when it was Boris and now, they're allowed to say, oh, we've just built X number of homes. Yet yeah, they're all empty, you know? We know, because you can go and sit along the river and see all the unlit places on, on a Friday night. There's, they've, been built, they've been bought by overseas investors. They've been and, and there are thousands and thousands of them. And that's another thing that we, you know, we really need to deal with, with empty homes. And I mean, th the other thing is being listened to. I mean, it's great that you're here. I'm really pleased. But I'd, I'm, it's a shame that the Labour MP couldn't come because we have a Labour council. They, in our wall, they got in by like 87%. We've been phoning them about a, a problem on our roof that is causing noise all night. It's a, a water heater for about eight months and nothing's happened. Um, no one gets back to us. No one talks to us because, you know, they, they, they don't need to. Um, just one, one, little, one more thing is, is one of the Tories' big things was how housing benefit has gone up and it got too expensive, so they have to cut it. Well, the reason was that they passed a law saying that council housing rents had to go up a bit more in um, it to, to, to make them nearer to local the, the local rent value. They, they put that law in place so the housing benefit bill got bigger because of their own um, their own policies. So as I say, um, there's loads of stuff. As a council tenant people used to be jealous of me. Now they, you know you're scum. It's, it's not right. Thank you. Um, I have got almost 10 speakers who want to who want to speak, and I'd like to encourage everybody to speak. So um, can you keep it to two minutes? I'm sorry, because otherwise we, we need to finish on time for 5.30. Um, uh, cheers, yeah. I'm, uh, my name's Paul Burnham. I'm from Harangay. I'm a council tenant and people are still jealous because council housing is a good thing and I think that we should talk about that. Uh, wh when they say they want to, uh, um, you know, the, the euphemism they use, I, I don't use the word, uh, all right, regeneration, but I won't call it that. I call it demolition. I call it social cleansing, if you like. But what they're really about, they're not about knocking down the buildings, is that they, say they, they get very upset about the buildings. So we don't like 1960s buildings. We have to demolish them for that reason. That's not the reason. What they really want to go get rid of it is the is the, the the political working class gain that we've got secure tenancies the fact that we've got really affordable rents the fact that we can hold
hold our landlords to account, you know, politically to account. We can elect them. We can elect somebody else. We can go and talk to them. They're going to have to talk to us. You can't talk to a private landlord like that. It's a completely different relationship. That's the key thing which they want to take away, and we should never, never, ne 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 never forget that. Therefore, we're still getting in the present time a lot of promises. You know, after the Greenfield fire, Theresa May came out and said, "Well, she's going to spend two billion pounds." on new, new social rent housing. I mean, it hasn't happened, but at least they have to talk about it. Equally, we get the Mayor of London saying, well, look, build new council housing at social rent. When you look at the figures, but it's not social rent. It's 50, 50 pounds a week higher. So we have to kick up about that, which is what we're doing. Go and see our council leaders. Go and see our councillors. Get them to complain about it. Get them to stand up about it. Because when you look at the assessed need, we don't have social rent just to be nice to tenants. It's because there's an assessed need for it. And the fact is that there are so many people on low income, uncertain income, no savings and in debt, that we need that. And if you take it away, the people who lose out are the poor, especially lower income families with children. That's why they should change their mind about it. So it's important that we do. And then just to finish up the really important thing about, about, um, about Corbyn and the promise and why that's so popular is because this is an issue that at some point is going to explode. And at the moment, we've got... Sometimes Labour councils, like our new councillors in Haringey, don't seem to quite understand that. They think they can faff around and people continue to vote for them, which at the moment they will, but at some point they won't. Does that mean they're going to vote for socialists or vote for Greens? They may not. Look around Europe. You can see the kind of populism that will be stirred up if you continue to have a, a, an industry that's built for developer profits where people lose out. So we have to seize, that, seize the direction of that. It can't go on the way it is forever. Yeah, I, I'm from Southwark, and um, you might have seen, if you're from London, um, the Elephant and Castle um, planning application was approved on um, Tuesday night, but that's um, a year and a half after the, um, the developers put in their original application. The reason it's taken so long is because of the campaign. And one thing I want to say about that campaign is it's incredibly... Um, diverse and it's um, it's still going it's going to continue um, the application was approved but it's n it's not over and you'll you'll continue to see us out on the streets during that campaign we had um, three demonstrations we had um, uh, 900 objections can you believe it 900 objections to a planning application that were made online um, let me just tell you a little bit about it so, demolishing the Elephant and Castle shopping centre, um, replacing it with other shops, um, but also 979 flats, the vast majority to be luxury flats, not for the people that currently live in the area. Originally, the applicant, uh, Delancey, was um, quite contemptuous of the local population and said that there should be only 33 socially rented homes out of that 979. Absolutely appalling. Sweeping away the migrant um, communities, so basically there's about 200 traders, the majority are migrant uh, traders, and uh, you know quite a large number are Colombian and Latin, um, Latin traders. And, the, and the, um, the campaign that we had as I said, included uh, demonstrations, objections. There were two occupations of the local university as well. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the groups that were involved, we had Stop the Elephant Development, Latin Elephant, Elephant Amenity Network, Southwark Defend Council Housing, uh, Southwark Notes, um, Southwark Momentum, um, and we had uh, 14 councillors and um, other um, and council candidates writing a letter of objection. Um, the the se seven of those maintaining their objection um, and are going to carry on fighting and asking the mayor to uh, call it in. So we'll all we'll all be part of that campaign. What it's done though, this application was approved. It's a Labour council. It was approved by four people on the planning committee. Two of those were Lib Dems. So effectively, a Labour Council leader who absolutely went around saying how wonderful the, the, um, 
the application was, could not get it through his own Labour Party. It's caused enormous splits, discussions inside, that, inside the Labour Party. And it is about time that local communities, um, you know, ha get their voices heard. And that's what we're doing. And we're making sure that that has repercussions for all those that support social cleansing and support getting in bed with developers inside local Labour parties. Um, I just wanted to raise two quick points. One being, um, you spoke about the tenure contract, but in Hammersmith and Fulham, it's actually five years that you get at the moment. In fact, I know a young person who is on a one-year contract, and if she sufficiently ticks some boxes, she will then get five years. And also the terms and conditions that qualify you to actually apply for a council house and the number of boxes that you have to be able to tick and how bad your situation has to be before they will actually even allow you to go on a waiting list. One of those is not allowed to be how badly, how bad your flat is, how much mold you have, how bad your electrics are. You're not allowed to apply for any help on the basis of that. You have to fight your private landlords, which... We all know what will happen if you do that. You'll end up losing your home and still won't get any help. I'm John. Is, this not, is it on? Yeah. I'm Josh. Um, I just wanted to like draw a little note to the title, obviously being uh, the class war on housing. Um, I just want to reiterate that like it, it is a war on housing. Like people are dying in the streets because they they're not they can't get homes. People died this winter. People froze to death um, in Birmingham, I believe, in London. Um, obviously, shocking. Like this isn't just about somewhere to sleep. It's about people actually dying on the streets as well. Um, Obviously, we know the reasons behind it. Um, obviously, the rich, the elite, private landlords, um, the fact that people can buy more private property so that people, other people can't buy it just so they make a little bit more money. Um, and obviously, yeah, um, just that, that whole power ba balance that capitalism allows. Um, I do applaud Labour, obviously, for their um, reforms. Obviously, they do help out. Um, but obviously, that's not, that's not the answer. Um, reformism doesn't actually change the system. Obviously, it's the, ch the, the system that needs to change. The system is what is allowing this to happen. Um, but yeah, obviously, as, as, as socialists, well, I'm guessing most people, I don't know. Raise your hand, socialists. <laughs> Good on you. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, like, as socialists and whatever the rest of you are, um, <laughs> um, we, do need to, we do need to push for reforms, obviously, harder than anyone, harder than Labour. Um, and show obviously that this is what we're fighting for but at the end of the day real change comes on the streets through people um, movements in the streets demanding that change to happen right now um, so obviously that's that's what I'd say get on the streets because this is this is where change happens not like not not through labor not through the government it's through people demanding that change on the streets now uh, thank you yeah cheers Yeah, unfortunately, Labour councils have been as involved in social cleansing in London as Tory councillors. And I think what they've been doing is trying to find a local solution to a national problem because the Tory government have implemented austerity through local councils and managerial Labour councils across the, the city have attempted to manage it by getting rid of their poor people. It's been quite explicit. If you get rid of the poor people and you bring rich people in, then you're going to be able to in, in, encourage business into the area. You're going to be able to raise business rates and that will compensate for, gov uh, for cuts in uh, national funding. I'm from Tottenham where we've had a successful campaign against uh, a right-wing right -wing Labour, Haringey Council's HDV. Uh, you might have heard of the HDV campaign where they basically wanted to give virtually all of the council housing in Tottenham uh, to private developers who were going to build lots of it, uh, knock lots of it down, uh, build new housing that was for shiny new housing for shiny new people. Um, 
we had a really successful campaign where uh, housing activists, tenants, we united with Corbynistas, left Labour Corbynistas. Um, and partly as a result of that, in the local council ele elections in May, the right-wing Labour Council was swept out and we've got a new left-wing uh, Corbynista council in place. Uh, but I think this is where the crunch comes because the new left-wing Labour Council, very sincere, very committed, they want to provide uh, housing for local people, but they are trying to find a local solution for a national problem. And if you're trying to find a local solution, that means you have to raise income locally. And one of their solutions is to double council tax. Well, who's going to pay for doubling council tax? It's going to be ordinary working class people. We've already paid our taxes to national government. The solution has, has to be national. And what this comes to is Jeremy Corbyn uh, and the new Labour government, if it comes in, saying we need a strategy of resistance because it is local Labour councils implementing austerity across the country and there has to be a strategy of resistance and that can't come from the top down, it has to come from below and that's go got to mean mobilising council workforces, mobilising tenants, mobilising the communities for rent strikes, for occupations and to say that we need housing for people and not for profit. Hi everyone, my name is Tina, I'm a comrade from Ireland, I'm a long-time member of the Socialist Workers' Party over there, and I'm also a People Before Profit councillor on Dublin City Council, and uh, <laughs> woo, revolutionaries in the system, oh my god. Um, but just listening, like apart from the accents obviously, but just if I close my eyes and listen to everything that you're saying today about housing, like we have the exact same issues in Dublin, in Ireland. And it's not because, you know, we're just a short hop over the Irish Sea away from you. It's because you have a Tory government, we have a Tory government, we've had successive governments which have systematically, everything that we've heard today have been systematically uh, cutting back on the provision of what we see as, as a right to a home. Um, so they're treating, the, 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 it's, it's a right to profit, where we see it as a right to home. And that has been systematic over decades in Ireland. Last year, we have, uh, we have hun over 100,000 families who are on our social council uh, housing lists. And in Ireland last year, they built less than, than a couple of hundred social houses in the entire country. And actually, we can't say definitively how many they built because the government has put so much unbelievable spin on the numbers that they've even been caught out lying and, and, and kind of trying to you know, package the numbers in different ways to make it seem like it's not a problem and saying things like, we want to solve, this is our housing minister, we want to solve the housing crisis, but we have to do it in a sustainable way. Madness. So... Like, I absolutely agree that you know in the council and we have, we've won on certain things, we've fought hard to get consultation, they now have a big long list and practically every local authority, estate in the country is on this list, they're going to see is it worth demolishing or not and we fought hard to win consultation rights, we only got them verbally agreed to but it's on camera so hopefully we'll be able to hold them to account. But just to agree with all the other speakers who've said the resistance has to be on the streets. We have a, um, I, I founded three years ago with a number of other comrades, we founded a National Homeless and Housing Coalition and we now have um, more than, I'd say more than 60 organisations and that includes big trade unions, political parties on the left, tenants unions, uh, housing activist groups, direct action groups, I mean everyone, especially the NGOs, which is really, I suppose, important because the NGOs are getting more and more radical because of their involvement in the coalition and because of the housing crisis, they're now actually writing to their supporters and um, asking them to come out and support protests. And recently we've had great conversations with the Irish Congress of Trade Unions who now recognise that housing is a workers' issue. So we're hoping that we're going to really push forward over the coming months. We had a huge mobilisation last April, uh, which was the biggest. I mean, we had 10,000 people on the street, but for us to mobilise that many people on housing was a huge victory. And there was a protest organised by some of the housing action groups here on the same day outside of the Irish Embassy. So I just want to bring solidarity from the Irish housing activists to the Irish, to the housing activists here, and to say... We have to unite and fight. This is, this is actually about a land grab. If they get their hands on the people's land and they have their way, which is to turn our right to a home and more into a commodity, that is the end. And I'll just finish on this. Right? Just to give you an example of what's at stake, in the constituency that I represent, there are 10,000 homes. And I'd say there are about 3,000 people on our family unit home, households on the local authority housing list. In the last three years, they have built... 5,000 student beds in that same area. 
I mean, you can't even begin to think the madness. And those are, are student beds that cost 250 quid a week. So they're not building those student beds for the working class kids in our area who can't even get to college anyway. So th this is what's at stake. They're taking our land in, in, in our council. There's this huge sell-off, an intent to sell off our council land. We have the Labour Party in the Housing Coalition. And the reason that they're there is because that's where we want to hold them to account. They can sit in the council and they can change the rules, but then they step out into the street and you see that like, they say a different thing. Their policies are a different thing. Their manifestos say a different thing in the coalition they're held to account by the people on the streets and that's what we want to do we want to have huge huge protests and we'd love to see the same here so as i said solidarity from ireland our fight is our fight it's all our fights if you're not involved please get involved you can see all the reasons why join socialist worker on the on the, we have to unite all the fights and together we will win hi my name is terry harper and uh this is going to be very short um i've uh I, I'm really encouraged by this meeting. I'm really encouraged by the audience. I think it's fantastic and the panel. So thank you very much. Um, we have a housing struggle in Westminster. Um, they've just announced on e that Ebury Bridge Estate is going to go. The whole thing is going to be demolished. It's a beautiful brick-built estate um, with 850 homes in it. On Monday evening, there's, there's a cabinet meeting at the council, a Tory council. Um, if anybody can make that to come along and support the tenants, um, give me your email afterwards and you're very welcome to come and protest there. Um, secondly, very quickly, there's also a meeting. Unfortunately, I can't go to either of these because I'm doing a Peabody involvement organization of tenants um, on that same night. But on, on Monday night, there's also in the Houses of Parliament the parliamentary um, um, campaign for council housing. At from 6 till 8. So if you want to go to that, you can also get the details from me. Just give me your email afterwards and I'll, I'll just forward on the stuff to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for your amazing discussion. I really do think we need another meeting on this. I'm going to ask Sean to come back. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I desperately need another half an hour to, to go over all those brilliant issues that were, that were raised there. Um, I think, you know, on, on the issues that were raised by ACORN, ACORN are amazing, um, managed to get the Assembly to pass a motion against Section 21, to ditch Section 21 yesterday. Uh, so the Tories did not vote for it. Um, have a look at the webcast. They were quite rude about tenants in general, about private renters. They are so on the landlord's side. So that's, a, that's still a battle. Um, and the next battle is rent controls, where we're making some baby steps towards trying to get some powers for London on, on rent controls as well. Um, and there definitely is a difference between, um, to address the last speaker, um, rules and promises. Um, it is really important to get good promises out of people that you elect. But yes, you're right. They break them. So if you change the rules, then that's much harder for them to change. So if, so if the next mayor wants to go back on having ballots, which actually Westminster Council have changed their policy, they had ballots, then they got rid of them, and now they're going to have to reintroduce them again, um, the next administration could stop using ballots, um, which is why I want to put ballots into planning as well. So at the moment, they're just funding rules. If we can get them into the planning rules, much harder for the next mayor to change the planning policies. That takes about two and a half years. Um, we can mount a stronger campaign around that. So it's, that's what I mean about getting the, the fundamental rules changed. And Section 21 is one of those, because Section 21 is the balance of power between landlords and renters. Uh, and without it, the renters get to stay on if they pay their rent and look after the house, um, except in very, very exceptional circumstances. At the moment, you have no right to stay on at all no matter how good a tenant you are, and that is wrong. Um, the other thing I would say, um, finally, is um, that we get a lot of promises out of Labour, and this has been outlined, they're going to build half a million homes. Whenever anybody says to you, I'm going to be to build some council homes, you've got to ask the question, is that net or gross? Because that is the question. With demolition, um, you end up with, with oh, quite often, a net loss in council homes from demolition. And the only spin you'll get from the people doing those schemes is we're building 500 council homes. Well, actually, maybe there were um, 550 council homes on that scheme in the first place, and you're building 500 council homes to replace them. Well done, but that's a net loss of 50. And you're building 900 luxury flats that are going to be empty. And that is the agenda that, that they absolutely have. And you have to ask the question, is that net or gross? Net or gross, absolutely every single time. And then finally, on how we, how we change, should we, should we be all coming behind Corbyn on this? Should we be 
continuing to work as individual campaigners? Should we all be coming together around one party? And I think that's, from a Green point of view, I just want to make the point that having a few Greens on every council is incredibly useful. We're a wedge with the people who ask the difficult questions. We don't have the vested interests. I mean, we don't because we're small, but also, and we're not in charge, but also because that's not part of our value system. And a part of our value system is to work within a movement. And I think that is what we've heard today. I think that's what Tanya was saying earlier on, that we, we all need to be working in our individual campaigns, but with solidarity with each other, and then getting together to change these very big issues and I think that's really healthy if we just ask ourselves the question who do we all need to support we'll never get anywhere there'll always be people going oh no but I've got a problem with that aspect of the person you've just said we all need to support if we all stay as our separate groups but we work together towards the big goals that's the way we win so there you go thank you so Eileen thank you yeah I mean, there is a meeting on Grenfell. Uh, you know, clearly we need to not just discuss this at Marxism. We need to discuss and organise wherever you are. Um, and to, s in s to some extent, the answer to some of the questions that people were raising is we need to build the homes we need. We need to build homes for the homeless, for the people in refuges. We need to restore tenancy rights and shamefully stop councils like Hammersmith and Fulham using Tory legislation to impose Tory plans to cut tenancies. I mean, we need that, that's a campaign right there. Huh? But we need to work out how we organise and how we do that. We need, because, you know, Frederick Engels wrote in 1872 that the state as it exists today is neither able nor willing to do anything to remedy the housing calamity. This is a, a crisis that capitalism creates because because of the drive for money and profit. And then capitalists weep over because they can't get any bus drivers who can afford to live in Reading or wherever, and they go, oh dear me. But they, their system can't solve it. And so, to give you another quote, I mean, Danny Dawling wrote a book about how actually in Britain there are more bedrooms per head of population now than there ever have been. The problem isn't just about the bedrooms and the houses, it's about the distribution and who owns them. And again, Engels, 1872. There is already a sufficient quantity of housing in the big cities to remedy immediately all the real housing shortage, provided they are used judiciously. This can naturally only occur through the expropriation of the present owners by quartering in their houses homeless workers or workers overcrowded in their present houses. And there you have it, the knob. So the question is, how and what, how do we build the homes we need? How do we take back the homes that exist that they don't need? Um, where's the money and how do we use our power to force a redistribution and for more of it to build our homes? And that means we have to build and organize. And I agree with Sean's, put as, as a housing movement, as housing campaigners, we organise together. And sometimes, Sean is absolutely right, when you get a log jam, this happened on Camden Council, and Labour won't blink when you're saying you have to address this issue. Sometimes, if you can get one or two Green councillors to take it up and agree with you publicly, you can bust Labour open. And, you know, and that's an honourable role, <laughs> in my opinion. 
But to build a movement requires the politics, because if we fudge the politics, we end up in the Haringey situation where you get a new radical councillors elected and then they go, oh, but there's no money. Oh, but, so ha but the developers don't agree that they should build 50% council homes. Well, duh, yeah. So how do we make them? And this is where, this is not about saying, never mind the practical stuff, we're off building from below. That is a false dichotomy. We are organizing as tenants, as people with common interests, as tenants and leaseholders and freeholders and whoever lives in the neighborhood and community organizations and trade unions and workers. That's, that's where we throw the net. And we have to organize with some honest discussion and reaching out to labor and elected reps and all the rest of it and build the campaigning action that can honestly do it. And if that's objecting to planning applications and it works, great, but it's better when you've got student occupations and street action going along outside it. But if it requires, as in Boston in the 60s, tent cities, if at Holloway, where they've demolished, emptied the women's prison, and there should be a minimum 400 council homes built on that site as well as community facilities. This is not going to happen because the planning system isn't providing it. We could make it happen if we got the campaigners and the homeless families and we were prepared to occupy the site or the perimeter of the site and say, we're not going until the homes we need are built here. Every council in Britain is selling off four public land sites a year. Everybody can build that kind of campaign, but it has to come from a very clear sense of who our class allies are and who our enemy is and how we organize against them. And if there's nothing else comes out of this meeting, that's, that's the job. Thank you.